Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Code Blue, dedicated to all things unidentified, brought to you by bluebook.tv, the platform of the unexplained. Please check it out. It's free. I am Thor, and thank you for listening. The topic of this episode, Foo Fighters. The first sighting of a Foo Fighter took place in the skies above the Rhine Valley on the border of Germany and France in November 1944, towards the end of World War II and at the height of the Allied invasion of the European mainland during Nazi retreat into Germany proper. This was seven months before the first nuclear test took place in the United States. The Foo Fighter sightings were reported by the airmen of the U.S. Air Force, the Royal British Air Force, the French Resistance Airmen, and the German Luftwaffe. Hitler had just fired the first long-range V-2 rocket from Germany into Paris on September 16, 1944, and more were to follow across the Channel to London and other strategic targets in the United Kingdom on September 18, 1944. Within 50 days from the V-2 rocket launch, the skies over Europe were teeming with strange lights, amber, red, or green in color. And as reported by U.S. airmen, sometimes they were seen one by one, and sometimes as many as 10, flying in formation, following air squadrons, mimicking their moves, and disappearing off radar at will. It is actually amazing that we have video footage of the Foo Fighters at all from that time, and each photograph is a precious piece of evidence. It was the 415th Night Fighter Squadron stationed at Lyon, France, that first reported Foo Fighters in November of 1944, and the name is credited to its radar operator, Lieutenant Donald Myers, on board the Smokey Stover, piloted by Lieutenant Ed Sluter while roaming the Rhine Valley north of Strasbourg in search of enemy fighters. You see, Lieutenant Myers and the entire squadron were such great fans of the newspaper cartoon strip Smokey Stover, created by Bill Holman in 1934, they named their plane after it. The cartoon featured a loony screwball fire captain, Smokey Stover, who constantly repeated the phrase, where there's foo, there's fire. And while flying the skies over France, Germany, the 415th saw foo and concluded, they must be fighters. Each side at the time believed the phenomena presented a new secret weapon by the other side. These lights were capable of moving at speeds much faster than anything known to the airmen at the time. The Foo Fighters stopped and turned on a dime, were not visible on radar or to the naked eye, and they appeared and disappeared at will. The airmen chose not to report them at first because they feared they'd be ostracized for such outrageous claims. But the Foo Fighters kept coming over the skies of war-torn Europe, still experiencing intense fighting between the Allied forces and the retreating German Luftwaffe. On December 17, 1944, near Breisach, Germany, a pilot reported seeing six flashing red and green lights following him in formation and mimicking his turns. When he banked towards them, at only 1,000 feet in distance, he could clearly see they were glowing light bulbs unattached to any metal body or craft before they disappeared before his eyes. He was flying to their exact location coordinates, and they simply weren't there anymore. On December 22, 1944, two more flight crews reported seeing lights. One crew near Hagenau saw two orange lights inside a singular glowing ball, and they saw it rising from the ground up to about 10,000 feet before proceeding to follow the pilot and plane for approximately two minutes Thereafter, the lights moved away, but kept visible distance for another few minutes. That is a long time to remain visible. To the airmen, 
They were clearly intelligently controlled, maneuvered up and down, back and forth, with a very deliberate flight-following pattern, according to Keith Chester, author of Strange Company, one of the better authorities on Foo Fighters in existence. In Dr. Lin Kitai's phenomenal documentary, The Phoenix Lights, whose amber glowing lights appeared over Phoenix, Arizona in March 1997, reminding us of the Foo Fighters' detailed descriptions, and Dr. Lin caught on camera perhaps the best still photographs, as well as video of the Phoenix Lights in existence, in the documentary, Lieutenant Colonel Jacques Drabier of the French Resistance Air Force provides one of the few rare Foo Fighter eyewitness interview accounts in existence, and his recollection is completely consistent with most accounts by the 450th Squadron and others. There are two photographs that need to be called out as perhaps the most valuable still image evidence in existence regarding Foo Fighters because they show the same lights from the same time and place but from two distinct and different vantage points, shot by two different people. One shot from the air, the other from the ground. Together, they collaborate the sighting and double enforce the light's reality by each showing the same factory chimneys within each of their frames, verifying the physical reality and location of their images' content. Another sighting from World War II sets the stage for many similar sightings ever since, yet bears no likeness to the Foo Fighters at all. Lieutenant Samuel Krasny reported seeing a wingless, cigar-shaped object, glowing red, less than a hundred feet distant from his plane's wingtip. Shocked at the sudden appearance of the much larger craft, Krasny communicated to his pilots suggesting evasive maneuvers, but they soon realized no matter how they turned the plane, the cigar-shaped object remained within 100 feet abeam their wingtip. Other airmen reported Foo Fighters with absolute consistency and description, and it was during a New Year's downtime period of R&R that embedded Associated Press journalist Robert Wilson heard from the 450 Squadron firsthand about the Foo Fighters. And this started the public's awareness of the phenomena. A day later, in January 1945, articles began appearing in newspapers and magazines on both sides of the Atlantic, including in the New York Herald Tribune. What followed in response from U.S. Army Air Command were a flurry of since-to-become-familiar go-to explanations. They were military flares, they were weather balloons, they were St. Elmo's fire. But the 415th Squadron brushed the explanations off as nonsense because the lights behaved differently, intentionally, flight followed, maneuvered intelligently, appeared and disappeared at will, Nothing like flare or balloon behavior. And they didn't look like lightning bolts either. Army Air Command did send investigators to collect photographs and interview airmen, but their report has been reported as lost in the aftermath of World War II. In 1953, the Robertson panel convened on behalf of the U.S. military and government to recommend an approach to UFOs in general, including Foo Fighter stories, that they be denied and ridiculed, marking the dawn of the denial protocol that has prevailed ever since. The panel otherwise offered no official explanation regarding the Foo Fighters, but since then, as with Lieutenant Colonel Jacques Bravier of the French Air Force, airmen, members of the US Air Force, the Royal Air Force, and the German Luftwaffe have come forward with consistent stories of Foo Fighter sightings. To quote Raymond Stephen, a retired naval aviator, I don't know what a Foo look like, but I've been a military and airline pilot for 27 years, and I've seen three things I could not explain nor identify. One was a nearly stationary fireball on the night sky around my same altitude, below 10,000 feet. Not sure about the distance, 
but only a few miles. Yellow orange with a very pronounced tail. But hardly moving from my perspective. I watched it for at least six or seven minutes. All my skeptic friends and my wife say, it must have been military flair. Well, I've seen dozens of military flares, and this was not a military flare. End quote. We can choose to disbelieve the servicemen or explain their sightings along the traditional denial line of arguing, but it simply does not pass muster as critical or intelligent thinking. Its aim is to get rid of the problem rather than solving their mystery by following the evidence of photos, videos, eyewitness accounts that for decades have collaborated their reality. You can watch or listen to this and other podcasts of the Code Blue series on Project Blue Book and BlueBook.tv. Please check it out. It's free. This has been a code blue for all things unexplained and unidentified. Please subscribe. And each day, let's show some compassion and kindness. I am Thor, and thanks for listening. See you next time.